All right, welcome to Defeating Adventism number 20. And as promised in the last video, when I said there's two things that really set Adventists off, one's being labeled a cult, and the second is ascension robes. This one's on ascension robes. I want you to look at this graphic here that was from a newspaper. This is from the uh, mid-1840s. It's a caricature of a 1843 Millerite hiding in a cabinet. You can see he's got crackers and meats and he's ready to the end of the world's coming and he's uh, this Millerite is in his chest here so ascension robes like I said are a very um, controversial thing with Adventists as a matter of fact ascension robes look something like this big long white robes as a matter of fact I was almost tempted to put this on get on the roof of my house and have my wife uh, take some footage uh, of me here and then I was gonna put it in the video but then I thought, yeah, that's just too embarrassing, too. I get it. I know why Adventists think that they're silly, because they are. Um, but Adventism does have something to say about Ascension Robes. I mean, they got a lot to say. I'm just going to quote uh, a couple sources here. One, um, I'm going to show you here in a minute on screen. This is Christ in His Sanctuary by Ellen White. So look with me here on the screen right now. And you see here... Uh, the book and you can see page 80 and I'm going to start reading where you see the red arrow and where it says this and Ellen White says what there was no making of ascension robes but all felt the need need of internal evidence that they were prepared to meet the Savior their white robes were purity of soul so that was their robes was purity of soul uh, characters cleansed from sin by the atoning blood of Christ so Ellen White's clear no ascension robes period but let's take it one more. This is my, uh, my favorite defender of Adventism, which is Francis Nichol, uh, because Ad Adventists rely on him um, so much, and he gets it wrong so often. I, I like him. I think he's quite, quite comical. So let's read along with, uh, and you'll see here on screen right now, um, Ellen G. White and Her Critics by Francis Nichol, page 298, 299. I'm going to start reading at the bottom of page 298 in my book here which says what? It says here, the most liable scurrilous attacks began to be made upon Adventist preachers and lecturers, and the most vindictive were the ministers of leading churches. All this is clear from the record. It was churchmen who gave the widest circulation to the wild stories that Adventists were planning silly ascension robes for the day of their expected advent. Did you read, catch that? Who was it that did this? What's he say here in this book? I'm just going to read it to you again. I don't need to show it to you on screen. You, you can go backwards and look at it. It was the churchmen who gave the wildest circulation of the wild stories in Adventist robes. We're going to read 12 accounts in, in 12 different newspapers. And I want you to, to remember this here and tell me, is it churchmen that are giving the wildest accounts? Because Mr. Nickel here, he seems to get it wrong quite often. So I'm going to... If I said 12 newspaper accounts, I'm going to do 15 newspaper accounts and one book. I'm, it's covering 12 years, 1843 to 1855. The reason it ends in 1855 is that you can just count me lazy. I got tired of doing this because it just keeps coming up. There's Ascension Rope stories uh, more in 1855 and beyond. They start tailing off if my memory serves me correct from the database I was looking at another 10 or 15 years but they're there. I just said, enough. I, I'm, I'm going to stick with 12 years and 15 newspaper accounts. And you can look here on the screen and you can see the map. Here's a map of the United States as it was uh, in 1855 with the states that we had at that time and places which were just mainly territories. You look at all the red push pins. I'm going to read these 15 newspaper accounts come from these 10 different states. Got two newspaper accounts from New York and two from Pennsylvania. That's why we have um, some doubling up there in, in, uh, in some of the states. But you can see we cover a wide range of states, all the way from the north of Maine, all the way down to Louisiana, Alabama, Michigan, Kentucky, and all through the New England states. Now, I already know what some Adventists are going to say. They're going to say, you know, that's William Miller. He's a Baptist. We're not Baptists. We have nothing to do with that, etc. I hear that all the time on YouTube. So I want you to look at this screen right now. 
What you have here in front of you is a review in Herald Magazine. It's a 100 year anniversary issue, um, 1949. Page 12 we're going to look at. So because it's an anniversary issue, as most anniversary magazines do, they start recounting some of their history. You can read this whole paragraph for context, just pause the video, but I'm just going to give you a quick synopsis. They're describing an exhibit and that, that is set up. Part of that exhibit is William Miller. And let me start reading the underlying text you see here on the screen to the right. It says what? William Miller and the great advent awakening with which he was connected and out of which came the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Period. Seventh-day Adventist Church came out of William Miller and the Second Day Adventist False Prophecy Movement of 1844. There it is in your magazine. Now I did mention a book. I mentioned I was going to do one book from 1872. This is that book right here. If you're an ex-Adventist, I highly recommend, or even an Adventist, read this book. It's called The End of the World, A Love Story by Edward Eggleston. It is a work of fiction from a gentleman who has knowledge of Seventh-day Adventists or, and Second-day Adventists, because that's really what this whole book is about. It's kind of a, um, a ridicule to a certain degree of the Advent movement. The gentleman that wrote this book is a very well-known writer from Indiana at the time in the 1870s. Uh, he was a circuit writer in the Methodist Church. And uh, so I'm just going to quote here. Let's look at this page right here. It's page 256, and I'm going to start reading very first sentence. He says what? The religious excitement reached its culmination as the 10th and the 11th of August came on. Some made ascension robes. Work was suspended everywhere. And he goes on and on and on to say. So, great book to get uh, for some of you out there because I bet that you have never heard of this book by Edward Eggleston called The uh, um, the End of the World, a, a, a Love Story. And again, you can go back and look at the title page, uh, dated 1872. Now we're going to look at the 15 newspaper accounts. Remember what Francis Nichols said, it's the, it's the evil churchmen uh, that are doing this. So let's go look at those newspaper accounts. All right, so let's pick this up on screen here. And we are going to start in January of 1843 in Baltimore. I am going to try to move through these kind of quickly. Um, try to keep the video length down. You can always pause these and look at these. Let me set it up though. You're going to see a, a format for the next 15 slides just like this. You're going to see the actual newspaper itself, generally on the left hand side of the screen. You are going to see a red line pointing to the column or the paragraph where the extracted blow up you see on the right hand side comes from. So that's your setup. Feel free to look up the original sources like I did, read the whole quote in context, and remember what Nichols said, it's these um, crazy church people, these uh, uh, preachers that are making on these comments, and let me, let me just spoiler alert, it's false, it's not, you can read them yourself. Um, they're reporters, they're local townspeople, etc. So Baltimore Sun, very first one. Uh, we can see here it says what? The ascension robes with which many of the Millerites on Long Island. So now we're, so it's a Baltimore newspaper, but reporting an event on Long Island, New York, have provided themselves are not likely to be wanted. They're talking about William Miller and his uh, changing of the, as we know, he had to change his dates. Let's go to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, January 24th, 1843, where it's this. It says what? Having ascension robes made uh, with which to mount up to the regions of bliss. So I'm talking about the Millerite delusion. So here we are in Pennsylvania. North Carolina Star. North Carolina is, is, is again, and this is very common for the day, taking a report from the newspaper, the Boston Bee, talking about Millerites, what are busily engaged in making their ascension robes. New York. Now, Ithaca, New York. And it talks about a friend is informing, you can see down here at the very bottom, Mr. Troy Budget, the author of this little paragraph, about um, fanatics uh, dressed in their ascension robes. And I like what Troy says down here, or Mr. Budget. He says, this is one of the consequences of the teachings of a weak-minded man. Amen. Um, if you're going to follow some crazy false prophet like William Miller, you're going to do crazy, silly things like, dress in ascension robes. 
We're going to jump to 1844 now. We're going to uh, go to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This was so common in, on all the newspapers. By the way, keep this in mind. So I'm just showing you the public ledger from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I'm showing you this article. When I was doing my research, I would see this article in 15 other papers. And I can say that for anything that I've previously gone over and what I am going to go over. So I am, I have, I shelled, I called out, let me say, those articles, you know, which were duplicate because newspapers picked up other newspapers stories and ran them so yeah you may be reading one here from the philadelphia the, the public ledger in philadelphia but you know this story ran in probably every state of the united states during this time as every other article you're going to see here so these are not isolated these were in hundreds of newspapers this account you're going to read here and do stop and read it you got it you got a guy that's making shoes he says you know what the world's coming to an end Everybody come, take all the shoes you want. Don't need them anymore. And so you know what? And they did. And they walked off with all his shoes. Um, when you think he might have regretted that a little bit? I do. Then it talks about this on the bottom here. A shop in the Bowery had a placard on which was inscribed in large letters, Muslins for, they were selling cloth for ascension robes. New York Daily Herald, November 8, 1844. Oh, that faded day. Look at these top four lines. Upon the memorable night in the annals of Millerism, on the 22nd of October, the poor deluded fanatics in the village of F, wherever that is, betook themselves to their housetops and their, and their camps in the fields adjacent and clothed in their spotless ascension robes, awaiting with fear and trembling the awful coming. And they talk about how cold and drizzly the night was and... Uh, by the way, remember what Francis Nichols said? It's the uh, the preachers that are that are making all this up. Haven't uh, come across that yet. November 9, 1844, again, after that faded day, the Times-Picayune in New Orleans said this, these deluded fanatics are, well, you know what? Um, uh, the great disappointment's over. Some of them are starting to return to their avocations, their churches. Hundreds who assembled on hills in the neighborhood of Philadelphia were clad in their ascension robes. And it says, now read this sentence carefully. They all had on India rubber overshoes, careful souls, as the night was rainy and raw and the ground was damp. So now we have not an account of ascension robes, but actually eyewitness testimony of their foot gear that they had on that day. So any Adventist that wants to tell me there's no account of ascension robes. <clears throat> First of all, that's why this video is being produced. That's why you got, I'm just showing you, <clears throat> excuse me, 15 newspapers amongst dozens, if not hundreds, that have all these stories. In Vermont now, we're going to another state, Montpelier, Vermont, November 9th, again, after that faded day of Adventism. We read here on the lines, we find the believers carried into the most strange conduct and the most pitiable perversion of all the rules of duty and the ob obligations both of religion and prudence. We hear of women arrayed in ascension robes, deserting the care of their households, sitting down in upper rooms, some even unfinished garrets to be as near as heaven as possible. Here we have eyewitness testimony from the... This is coming from the people who see these Miller rites in these odd, fanatical behaviors as you have here in this Vermont Patriot of 1844 the Freeman's Journal now see this even got international so the the Freeman's Journal in Dublin Ireland picked up this Philadelphia article of October 31st and it says this on the evening of the 22nd many hundreds of those crazy people prepared to camps near the city attired themselves in long white cotton dress, like I showed you earlier, which they called their ascension robes, and were seen wandering through the woods on the banks of the river by moonlight like sheeted ghosts. Another eyewitness testimony to what the Millerites now, at least some of them, became Seventh-day Adventist were doing. Middlebury, Vermont, in the Middlebury Register. Oh, I like this one. A female disciple of that charming, I love it, I love the sarcasm, the charming doctrine that has been, she's been sent to state prison for stealing her ascension robe. 
Of course, it's a necessary millennial dress. What she did was she walked into a neighbor's house and stole the cloth so she could make it herself. She got two years in state prison for that. Again, here it is. It's, it's not the preachers that are making this up. We, we got a Millerite that, that, that went to state prison <laughs> went to jail for two years for stealing it. Cloth so she could make her ascension robe. New Orleans, Crescent, New Orleans, Alabama. The sheriff that they picked up a story out of Lexington, Kentucky, uh, uh, has arrested two Millerites hunting for others on charges of adultery. Well, that doesn't sound very good. Their ascension robes are hid away in lavender. So evidently they found some ascension robes when they when they made some arrests there in Lexington, Kentucky. Here we are now in Bloomington, Indiana, talking about uh, uh, what's going on actually in the state of Maine. And it says, well, it's a good time for Millerites. It is said, now look at this is 1854. The great disappointments long gone, and we still have this happening. Like I said, I only quit after 12 years because I just quit. I could have kept going. Um, Anyway, let me keep reading before I get sidetracked. A good time for the Millerites. It said they are again excited in holding their great meetings and tabernacles, putting on their ascension robes. There they are. doing. Ten years later, they just don't give it up. What's the proverb say? Like a dog returning to its vomit is a... Is an, is an Adventist, in this case a second-day Adventist, returning to their ascension robe. Here we are in Prattville, Alabama. And what's this one say? It says, let the printer live in the world is coming to an end. A second Adventist in Middlesex County who has his ascension robes already and sleeps on the roof of his house every night. See, they just don't give it up. Have you read an account yet, by the way, where leading preachers are spreading this? No, it's the people living in the communities with these second-day Adventists who are giving first-hand testimony of what they see. Weekly Wisconsin. What do they say? You can see here they picked up the story. This story they picked up from New York. This column here is so long. Um, the column you see in front of you extends about three, maybe four times its length. This tells a long story. So I'm just going to just do two underlines here in just the first piece. It says, my friend Damapool lately became convinced that, according to the comfortable prediction of Mr. Miller, the end of the earth would become speedily visible to the naked eye. Of course, right? This has been going on now for, what, at least 11 years? And talks about him and his preparing his ascension robe. Again, um, St. James, Michigan, the North Islander... Um, newspaper says this millerism they you know here we are now we're in 1855 we are now 11 years past the great disappointment and it says what millerism we believe has pretty much died out though we occasionally hear of a day being fixed for the blowing of gabriel's horn and of the congregation parties of the elect clad in ascension ropes ready to go see they just didn't give it up 11 years later and they're still following the false prophet William Miller. And as we already know, of course, by studying Adventism, the false prophet Ellen White, who kept making her predictions about Christ's return and food for worms and translated to heaven. And you can look at some of my videos on that. So yeah, false prophets galore in 1855, be they uh, Millerites still following William Miller or those that are starting to align themselves with the uh, uh, newly formed sect of Seventh-day Adventists. It's of course, they weren't Seventh-day Adventists yet. That's 1863, but they were starting. And so what else do they say here? You know what? He continues and he says, what, the Lord has so often broken his promises. Yeah, well, yeah, the Lord didn't break his promise. They're kind of being sarcastic uh, here. Uh, and his chosen people. Yeah, no, these are continuing to follow the false prophet. So I went through these rather quickly. Feel free to stop, go back, read the whole article. 15 newspaper accounts, that one book from 1872, covering 12 years. And remember, I just quit. I, there's more. I could have went into late 1850s, early 1860s and still give you stories of Adventists and Ascension Rubs covering these 10 states. But you know what? There's nothing in the Bible that says Ascension Rubs are evil, wrong, bad, send you, send you to hell. No. But what is the doctrine that led these Adventists to put their ascension robes on? It's the false prophet, 
William Miller and the false doctrine he promulgated. And you know what? It's the false doctrine that Adventists today promulgate. Remember what Francis Nichols said? Who's, who spread these rumors about ascension robes? It's the leading preachers of the churches. You didn't see one, did you? But you did see firsthand testimony from people living around Second Day Adventists and what they saw. Well, Adventism is easily explained, and it's easily explained with this verse right here in the Bible. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And they're going to wander off into their myths of putting on their ascension robe and listening to the false teachings of, you see here a photograph of William Miller. I could even throw Ellen White on top of that because she too is a false teacher and a false prophet. If you're in Adventist and you're listening to this, I get it. I understand ascension robes are silly. They are embarrassing. I would be embarrassed too. But you ought to be more concerned with following the false doctrine of the Adventist church as first promulgated by William Miller. It is time to repent of the sins of following this false Adventist religion and get out of her.